हेलो नमस्कार दिस इज फर्स्ट पोस्ट इन यू वॉचिंग वैंटेज विद मी पलकी शर्मा The biggest story tonight comes from Pakistan the army has lost the election usually countries have armies in Pakistan the army has a country and this is an army that has never won a war and never lost an election but this time there was an anti climax Nawaz Sharif has just declared himself the winner the single largest party at least that's what he says but it doesn't really matter people in Pakistan have voted against the army there are reports of protests in many parts of the country after widespread reports of rigging What will this election mean for Pakistan, India and the world? More risk, more uncertainty. We'll discuss all of that. And speaking of risk, Sam Altman, the man behind ChatGPT is betting big again. A 7 trillion dollar project on chips. We'll tell you all about it. In Myanmar, the junta remains on the back foot as the rebels gain ground. What does it mean for Indian projects and security? In Ukraine, Zelensky has fired his army chief. In the US Joe Biden says his memory is fine after a probe report questioned his mental capacity. In Singapore the prime minister has asked people to add little dragons to their family we'll tell you why. Amid economic slowdown and cost of living crises luxury brand Hermes is recording booming sales. Why is Taylor Swift getting so much hate? And what happens when an adopted child is returned? All this and more coming up the headlines first. In India at least four people dead in the violence in Uttarakhand's Haldwani around 250 injured including several police officers curfew imposed schools and internet services shut shoot at site orders issued against rioters violence erupted after the demolition of an illegal Islamic school and mosque Israel launches fresh air strikes on Rafah in South Gaza around 1 and 1/2 million Palestinians are living in the city which borders Egypt The US says Israel's actions in Gaza have been quote unquote over the top. This is the sharpest criticism from Israel's top ally since the war began in October. Donald Trump set for a big legal victory. The US Supreme Court likely to reject a bid to disqualify Trump. In December, Colorado's top court had disqualified him from the state's primary ballot for his role in the 2021 Capitol riots. Trump had challenged the verdict in the Supreme Court. The fractured 15 member West African bloc appeals for unity holds emergency talks on the political crisis in Senegal. President Macky Sall has delayed the election there. Earlier three coup hit countries exited the economic community of West African states called ECOWAS. Watch your weight while traveling on Fin Air. The Finnish carrier has begun weighing passengers with their carry-on luggage. Says it will help better assess the aircraft's weight before takeoff the weighings will happen till may on a voluntary basis and fifa break its silence on the introduction of blue cards saying talk of blue cards at elite levels in football is premature a blue card will be less severe than a red one since the 1970 world cup there has been no change in the rules regarding cards largest single party in the country today Clear your calendar, grab some popcorn and buckle in because this weekend is going to be rocky. Pakistan's election has just delivered the mother of all surprises, a googly for the ages. And at the receiving end is the army, a seasoned batter who's seen it all. 
So who will prevail in this high stakes contest? Let's look at the scoreline first. Nawaz Sharif's Pakistan Muslim League is at 43 seats. The Bhutto's PPP at 28. And now for the big surprise, candidates backed by Imran Khan at 57. Pakistan's National Assembly has 266 seats. So to form a government, you need 134. And Imran Khan is in pole position. But Nawaz Sharif doesn't seem to care. He visited his party headquarters a short while back. And Sharif says he has won this election. Muslim League Noon is the largest single party in the country today after the elections. And I understand that we are this mulk ko bhamar se nikalne ki tadbir karein. Hamne pehle bhi Allah ke fazlo karam se mulk ko mushkilat se nikala hai. Aur aaj bhi nikalne ka etamam kar rahe hain. Aur mein aapko batana chahata hoon ke hum sab partiyon ke mandate ka etaram karte hain. Jin ko bhi mandate mila hai. How about that? His party is trailing. But Nawaz Sharif says he has won the election. Well, that's Pakistani politics for you. Nawaz Sharif's plan is to build a coalition. He says he will reach out to other parties. But why is he celebrating prematurely? What exactly happened in the last 24 hours? Let's recap. Voting in Pakistan ended at 5 p.m. local time yesterday. Then the drama began. Pakistan's election commission began counting the votes. Most of us had the same expectation. An easy victory for Nawaz Sharif. After all, the army had played every dirty trick. Imran Khan was in jail. His party had lost its election symbol, the bat. Its top leaders were intimidated. So what could possibly go wrong? Well, late into the night, results started trickling in. And what did they show? Imran Khan's candidates in the lead. Most of them had contested as independents. And yet they were leading. Some trends showed Imran Khan's party, the PTI, crossing the majority. And that too comfortably. It is quite apparent to know that uh, Pakistan Tariq and Saf is leading on 125 seats by huge margins. Uh, that means in due course of time, we shall be in a position to form governments at the center and in at least two provinces, two of the four provinces. The other side was in disarray. Nawaz Sharif himself was trailing from his seat. Most of his party leaders were nowhere to be seen. In contrast, Imran Khan's PTI hit the streets. Their supporters rallied outside polling stations. They refused to leave until counting was done. From Pakistan, Tehreek e Insaf, the electoral symbol bat was withdrawn. Our leader Imran Khan was jailed. PTI supporters were given a message that you cannot win. But still, PTI supporters did not lose heart. The result of today's polling will be all in our favor. The PTI supporters who young youth are here. If our leader is in jail, we are his lions outside and we will fight until a lion is out of jail. And we want Imran Khan to be out of jail as soon as possible. And inshallah, we will still win. So everyone began asking the same question. Had Pakistanis beaten the army? Was Rawalpindi's script unraveling? Well, it was too early to say. Once the early trends emerged, a few suspicious things happened. First of all, the Election Commission's website went down. People could not access it anymore. Then the counting slowed down. Suddenly, results were simply not being published. Then at 3 a.m. local time, the Election Commission called a press conference in the thick of the night, 3 a.m. After all, all of this, you would think that the Chief Election Commissioner would show up, at least give an explanation for what was happening. Well, think again. Another election official addressed this presser, and he made two important announcements. One, the delay was because of the internet. Pakistan had snapped mobile services on voting day. Apparently, that was slowing things down. And announcement number two, the early trends were unverified, meaning the PTI's lead may not have been real. That's what the election commission officer said. Now, obviously, this sounds fishy. Because yesterday, the election commission said something very different. They said the internet shutdown would not affect counting. So what changed in a few hours? Only they can tell us. But afterwards, we saw some worrying pictures. Soldiers deployed outside counting centers. Soldiers pushing away PTI workers. Even some footage of ballot stuffing. Multiple journalists and activists have posted these pictures and videos, but we cannot vouch for their authenticity. 
बाहर चले मैं बाहर चले मोर ला लगे क्या मोर ला दे Which brings us to today. Counting speed has improved compared to yesterday, but still, still the pace is slow. Pakistan's homegrown result transmission system is not working, so the results are being relayed physically, which means rigging is easier. The PTI has pointed out several examples. Take a look at this document. It shows results from a constituency in Lahore. The winner is Nawaz Sharif. But now look at the numbers and listen to this carefully. Around 293,000 votes were cast. 293,000. And how many were counted? 294,000. So where did these extra thousand votes come from? It looks like a classic case of rigging, and I must say, a poorly executed one. But even rigging can only help so much because Nawaz Sharif actually lost his other seat. He was contesting from two constituencies. One was in Lahore, the other was in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. Thanks to magic numbers, he won in Lahore. But the other seat, he lost. Reminds me of something he said on the campaign trail. Listen to this. I love you. I love you too. If you love me, Nawaz Sharif also loves you. The Pakistani voters have given the answer. They do not love Nawaz Sharif, not like they used to. He now represents a politics of the old, a politics that young Pakistan does not identify with. Many voters have openly called out the rigging. Har kam pehle decide ho chuka hai. Yahan ham awam ko na sirf hamari awam ke liye ham hame sirf na bewa khub banane ke liye sara kar rahe hain. Mera chota se ek hai. मेरा वोट चौदह साल से एक जगह पर रह रहा हूँ मेरा वोट उन्होंने उठा उठा के कोर्ट खोया सही से उठा के उन्होंने कजाफी स्टेडियम में उठा फेंक दिया मुझे अब ये बताएं मेरा वोट चौदह साल से उधर है और कजाफी स्टेडियम चला गया मैं किस तरह डालूंगा जाओ उधर बताएं ये कोमत की नलाकी है जी ये पास पास कर रात भी रात बारह बजे आ रहे हैं ये तो लक्षण हमें नहीं नजर आ रहे कुछ भी कोई रिजल्ट नहीं आया जो डिले कर रहे हैं रिजल्ट तो ये तो मतानाज़ा बनाने वाली बात है ना कि कल से हम टीवी पे देख रहे हैं कि कौन सी पार्टीज जीत रही हैं और कितना आ गया हर कोई रिजल्ट बता रहा है और अब जो कुछ चेंजिंग हो रही है तब्दीलियां हो रही हैं और रिजल्ट को जितना ज़्यादा डिले कर रहे हैं तो ये तो मतानाज़ा बनाने वाली बात है Well, it's not game over yet. The results still show Imran Khan in the lead, but the Sharifs are not giving up. Maryam Nawaz says her party, the Muslim League, will be the single largest party. She says Nawaz Sharif will give a victory speech once the results are in. He has already spoken. He says theirs is the single largest party. So, did the tide change overnight? The Sharifs seem to think so, but don't expect this drama to end with the results. Just think about it. Early trends showed the PTI forming a government, but 24 hours later, they could lose. How would you react to that? If you're an Imran Khan supporter, you would be outraged. And by the looks of it, Pakistan has many of those. So this election drama is not ending any time soon. In fact, it's unlocked a new crisis. Now, what does this mean for Pakistan and the world? More uncertainty for sure, but that's not all. This election changes many dynamics, both within Pakistan and outside. We we'll look at the three biggest takeaways. What should you make of this election and the result in Pakistan? Number one, Pakistan's army has failed, at least for the time being. Look at everything that they did for Nawaz Sharif. Got his cases dismissed, brought him back from London, put his chief rival in jail, delayed the vote to help him campaign, and yet the public sentiment was against them. Let's be clear about that. The final results may tell a different story, but this was a vote against the Pakistan army, against its meddling in politics, and that spoils Rawalpindi's calculations because this election was supposed to be a clean slate, a chance to move beyond Imran Khan. But now Pakistan is back to square one. PTI supporters are organizing rallies and protests. Cases have been filed against 30 of them in Islamabad, and chances are this number will increase. So the polls have plunged Pakistan into more crisis. 
They've busted the army's aura of invincibility. Takeaway number two. The election has shown the power of technology in polls, especially artificial intelligence. Imran Khan was arrested in August last year, meaning he could not campaign. His party was also barred from holding rallies and Pakistani media was banned from giving him airtime. Now, normally that would kill a political party, but not the PTI. Because they turned to technology, Imran Khan used AI to deliver speeches. They used deep fake. His party held online rallies. They overcame physical restrictions with a digital outreach. In fact, their social media game was on point. The PTI has more than 9.8 million followers on X. The Pakistan Muslim League, Nawaz Sharif's party, has just 2.5 million. And it's pretty active too. Whether it's posting videos from polling stations or reaction videos from leaders or even foreign media analysis, the PTI's online campaign was very Gen Z. And it could be a template for other leaders and countries. And finally, takeaway number three, the external dynamics. What does this election mean for India and the world? Well, it's a tough one. For starters, Pakistan is a nuclear power. It is also home to multiple terror groups, the world's terror headquarters, if you will. And it's on the brink, its economy. So instability here is worrying. That's the biggest concern for Western countries. That's also why they keep backing the army to make sure that the nukes are safe. But this election will put the West in a tough spot. On the one hand, the army is their, is their ally. On the other hand, the rigging is blatant. So what will Western countries do? The United States has not criticized the internet shutdown. It says it was tracking the curbs, whatever that means. We are concerned about the restrictions on the exercise of freedom of expression. Uh, we are tracking reports of restrictions on internet and cell phone access across Pakistan on polling day. Uh, and we, along with the international community, will continue to emphasize the importance of democratic institutions, a free press, a vibrant civil society, and expanded opportunities for political participation of all of uh, Pakistan's uh, citizens. But um, I'm not going to get ahead of any of the other uh, official election results, so I'm not going to comment on this any further. Well, let's hope this is a wake-up call for them. Western countries have long been guilty of backing Pakistan. They've armed Pakistan's army, bailed out the government every time it's messed up, and ignored their support for terrorism. Maybe now is the time to shut the tab, to realize what Western money is used for in Pakistan. It doesn't reach the people for sure. Instead, it is used to enrich the army, to crack down on voters and subvert democracy. Will the U.S. impose sanctions on Islamabad for this? I wouldn't count on it. The Americans forget democracy when it comes to Pakistan. Just think back to the elections in Bangladesh last month. Do you remember the pressure from Washington, the scathing criticism? But with Pakistan, it's all very businesslike. So Western capitals need to take a hard look at their policy because the current one is wrong. India too needs to be on alert. A clean slate may have triggered hopes of a reset, but now all bets are off. Pakistan's army looks weak and cornered. And that also makes them more dangerous. We also can't rule out domestic unrest. Imran Khan's party is not the only one complaining of rigging. Most opposition parties feel robbed. What if they hit the streets in protest? What if terror groups capitalize on the unrest? These are all real possibilities. Of course, there is nothing that India can do about it. The only option is to wait and watch and be on your guard. Now let's talk about Sam Altman, the face of the global AI revolution. In November, Altman was front page news. He'd been unceremoniously sacked from OpenAI, a company that he created. Within weeks, he made a comeback. The entire saga was like a Hollywood blockbuster. There was corporate backstabbing. The board of OpenAI had turned on Altman. His departure led to a company-wide rebellion. Corporate giant Microsoft then made a power play. They offered a job to Sam Altman and practically everyone at OpenAI who wanted to leave. Soon, Sam Altman rose like a phoenix from the ashes. Within days of his sacking, he was reinstated as the CEO of OpenAI, and the shakeup only made him stronger. It was quite the story. He's now the undisputed champion of the global AI revolution. And with his newfound superpowers, he's gearing up to make his next big bet.
a $7 trillion bet on chips with the potential to, sh to shake up the global semiconductor market. The future of technology is chips and AI. The problem is there aren't enough of them. Altman wants to fix that by expanding production. You see, apps like ChatGPT run on special chips. And here's how they work. Imagine an office full of large stacks of paper. You are the manager. You need to sort out all these documents. You're looking for something specific, and you must find it quickly. So you get a bunch of interns to sort out your stuff. They're keen, but they lack experience. They take a lot of time in sifting through the papers, but you don't have that kind of time. So you get more people to do the job, this time experienced ones, those who've done it before. And they prove to be more efficient. And that's exactly how AI apps like ChatGPT work. Chips are like the workers in office. Some can do a basic job and deliver slowly. Some have advanced skills and act faster. Some chips are designed just for AI. They're called GPUs, graphic processing units, GPUs. Think of them as your experienced hands. They're more efficient. And the more such chips you have, the better and faster you can deliver. You can sort through more data quickly. You can reach more customers. And that's the goal that Sam Altman is chasing. If you cannot buy more such chips, make them yourself. That's the idea. Right now, NVIDIA has the monopoly in the AI chip game. We told you about this company yesterday. Last year in September, NVIDIA had 80% of the market share, 80, 80% of the market share. Now, Sam Altman wants a slice of this pie. In fact, he wants to reshape the entire market. The plan is bold and ambitious. Last year, global chip sales stood at over $500 billion. By 2030, they're expected to touch $1 trillion. Altman wants to raise $5 to $7 trillion for, for his chip venture. So the proposed investment is seven times bigger than what the market is expected to be. Where will this money be spent? To ramp up manufacturing and build infrastructure. Altman is basically proposing a partnership. He wants to bring together the top stakeholders in this space, the chip makers, the investors, and those who can power such factories. He wants to work with all of them. And what will be his role? Reports say he wants to be an investor. He'll offer money and set up the funds to build the factories and the chip foundries. And once these facilities are ready, the chip makers can run them. Now for this, he's looking to mobilize trillions. But where will the money come from? Apparently, there are potential investors. Sam Altman is said to have pitched the idea to the government of the UAE, to Masayoshi Son, who's the CEO of SoftBank, and to TSMC, the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company. It's the world's biggest chip maker. The ask is for $7 trillion. Let's put that figure in, in perspective. Microsoft is the main investor in OpenAI, also the world's biggest tech company. Microsoft is worth over $3 trillion. Apple comes second, worth over $2.9 trillion. So together, Microsoft and Apple are worth around $6 trillion. Sam Altman is asking for $7 trillion. It is a fact that entrepreneurs thrive on taking risks, and there are no rules on how big is too big. As of today, this looks like a visionary project. From a future opportunity to a present danger, let's talk about Myanmar, the coup hit neighbor of India, now in the grip of violence. The military junta is in trouble. It is losing ground and the faith of its neighbors. First, it was China that cut its losses. Now it's India that's being forced to take some tough calls. An Indian project in Myanmar has come to a grinding halt. We're talking about Kaladan, a major undertaking aimed at improving India's connectivity with Southeast Asia. Kaladan was supposed to connect India's Kolkata port with Myanmar's Sitwe port. This is in the Rakhine state of Myanmar, Sitwe. But in recent days, progress has stalled. Reports say rebels in Myanmar have captured a town called Paletwa. This is a border town near the Indian state of Mizoram. The Kaladan project runs through this town. According to one lawmaker in Myanmar, the project is now, quote unquote, almost dead. The army has lost control in this area. Rebels are in charge of all major towns and supply routes, and they're set to be gaining ground in Rakhine. So it's only a matter of time before they capture the entire state. They have surrounded the port of Sithwe, 
and attacked Myanmar's navy there. The Kaladan project was supposed to connect to this Sitwe port. So clearly it is in trouble. And India has been watching these developments closely. This week, New Delhi issued an advisory. It said the situation in Rakhine is deteriorating. Indians in the state should leave. And those who plan to go there should not. Yesterday, another announcement was made. India scrapped the free movement regime. The free movement of people between India and Myanmar, it was scrapped. It was signed in 2018 for the benefit of families living on both sides of the border. It allowed cross-border movement up to 16 kilometers in either country without a visa. So if you lived in Myanmar, you could get a one-year border pass. You could cross over to India and stay here for two weeks at a stretch. The free movement regime also improved access to education and health care, plus it encouraged cross-border trade. But given the volatility in Myanmar, India is scrapping it. It also plans to fence the entire border. It's 1,600 kilometers long, the India-Myanmar border. 1,600 kilometers, New Delhi wants to fence it. What does it mean for Myanmar? People who want to come to India will have to get a visa now, no exceptions. Those who try to cross over without a visa will be treated as illegal immigrants. And this was needed, as a lot of people have been pouring into in, to the, to the Indian side. Since last year, India has sent back more than 200 soldiers from Myanmar. They were attacked by rebels, so they came to India to seek refuge. Now, this is an influx that New Delhi does not want. Myanmar is unraveling. It poses a security threat, not just to India, but also to Bangladesh, another neighbor. Recently, rebels seized an outpost on the Bangladesh-Myanmar border. When they struck, Myanmar's border guard force was on duty. They could not withstand the rebels. We're talking about 60 border guards here. All of them fled. They were seen running towards the Bangladesh border. Did the guards cross into Bangladesh? We don't know yet. What we can tell you is that Bangladesh too has heightened security. Bangladesh and Myanmar share a border that is 270 kilometers long. Just like New Delhi, Dhaka too is worried. The fighting in Myanmar is now spilling over in all directions. Now let's talk about a frozen conflict, the war in Ukraine. President Zelensky is in a difficult position. His military campaign is failing to deliver. Western aid is drying up and Ukraine's counteroffensive has hit a dead end. So Zelensky is trying to shake things up. Yesterday he sacked his army chief and appointed a battle-hardened general in his place. This is the biggest change in Ukraine's military leadership since the war with Russia began in 2022. But will a change of guard be enough to revive Kiev's campaign? Our next report explores. A handshake is often a symbol of camaraderie. But in this picture, it indicates the end of a period marked by tension. The person on the right is General Zaluzhny. Until recently, he led Ukraine's armed forces. But this week, he's leaving the job. A war is perhaps the worst time for a military shakeup. But for Zelensky, a change had become necessary. There was growing friction between him and the general. Zaluzhny was increasingly at odds with the president. Writing for The Economist last year, Zaluzhny had admitted the war with Russia had reached a stalemate. Zelensky's office disagreed. The president's team declared such commentary only benefits Russia. But Zaluzhny refused to be held back. Within weeks after this interview, his differences with Zelensky became more apparent. Zaluzhny wanted a mass mobilization. He wanted another 500,000 soldiers to be drafted. Zelensky disagreed. In recent days, the two leaders only grew further apart. The general took his complaints public. In December, Zaluzhny gave a press conference, where he declared that he was unhappy with the way soldiers were being drafted. As for the local draft offices, as of now, Frankly speaking, I'm not currently satisfied with the work of the draft officers. If I was satisfied with their work, we would not discuss this bill right now. The general was talking about a proposed law to reform the army draft program. The criticism was damaging for Zelensky. Zaluzhny became a household name and a national hero for fighting the Russians. He was an inspiring commander for his troops. 
Despite the stalled counter-offensive, Ukrainian showed more faith in Zeluzhny. According to a recent opinion poll, Zeluzhny was more popular than Zelensky. Despite that, the president sacked the general. He believes Ukraine needs a new approach and a different direction under a different general. Tens of generals are being considered for leadership positions in the army and will serve under the leadership of the most experienced Ukrainian commander, a true battlefield commander, Colonel General Alexander Sirsky. He has successful defense experience. He conducted the Kiev defense operation. He also has successful offensive experience, the Kharkiv liberation operation. I appointed Colonel General Sirsky as the commander-in-chief of the armed forces of Ukraine. Sirsky has led Ukraine's ground forces since 2019. He has a reputation of being an obsessive planner. When Russia invaded Ukraine, Sirsky successfully defended Kiev. He also pushed the Russian forces away from Kharkiv. As he charts the future for Ukraine's military, Sirsky has his work cut out. Breaking the Russian defences is just one part of his mission. Sirsky also needs to fill in the big shoes of his predecessor. Is Joe Biden unfit to be president? It's a question we do not like asking. After all, age is just a number. We would much rather judge Biden on his policies. But the president is not helping his case. Recently, Biden was investigated by a special counsel. The case dates back to the last decade. Biden was suspected of mishandling secret documents. And what did the probe find? That Biden was guilty. He mishandled the documents. But that's not the biggest headline from this probe report. That would be this. Biden's memory has significant limitations. It's apparently hazy, poor and painfully slow. That's what the special counsel said. Now, full disclosure, this counsel is a Republican. So he had reasons to trash Biden's memory. But his findings are still concerning. Apparently, Joe Biden did not remember when he was vice president. He also couldn't remember when his son died. And that last claim really riled up Biden. The president was visibly agitated by it. Listen to this. There's even reference that I don't remember when my son died. How in the hell dare he raise that? Frankly, when I was asked the question, I thought to myself, it wasn't any of their damn business. My memory is not good. My memory is fine. My memory, take a look at what I've done since I've become president. So Biden says his memory is fine. But moments later, he messed up. He was talking about aid passing from Egypt to Gaza, but he got confused between the presidents of Mexico and Egypt. As you know, initially, the president of Mexico, Sisi, did not want to open up the gate to allow humanitarian material to get in. I talked to him. I convinced him to open the gate. Just to clarify, El Sisi is the president of Egypt. Andres Manuel Obrador is the president of Mexico. It's not the first time that Biden has got confused. He's making a habit of it. On Sunday, Biden got the French president's name wrong. He called him Mitterrand instead of Macron. Then on Wednesday, he made another gaffe. He confused Angela Merkel with Helmut Kohl. Both were German chancellors, but Biden only dealt with one of them, and that was Merkel. These mix-ups have raised questions about Biden's abilities. Is he fit to be in office, let alone run again? The Republicans, of course, don't think so. Chances are they will weaponize this report. It confirms what they have been saying for a while, that Joe Biden is mentally unfit. But is Donald Trump any better? He too has confused names recently. Trump was talking about his response to the Capitol riots. He confused Nancy Pelosi for Nikki Haley. Nikki Haley, you know, they, did you know they destroyed all of the information, all of the evidence, everything? Deleted and destroyed all of it. All of it because of lots of things. Like Nikki Haley is in charge of security. We offered her 10,000 people, soldiers, National Guard, so whatever they want. They turned it down. Guess who's capitalizing on this? Nikki Haley. She's released a new campaign advertisement. It brands Trump and Biden as grumpy old men. Now, some may call it a cheap shot, but age has become a key issue in this election. Joe Biden is 81 years old. Donald Trump is 77 years old. Compare that to the average age of U.S. presidents, just 55 years. So the concerns are real. 
Around 76% voters are concerned about Biden's age. 48% think Trump is too old to be president. So both men face the same criticism. But is it a fair criticism? That's where the debate gets fuzzy. Presidents are public servants at the end of the day, so technically they're hired by the people. So why can't people demand younger presidents? Employers do it all the time. In the current atmosphere, it makes a lot of sense. The US is involved in two wars. It is also facing challenges from China. So now is the time for young, charismatic leadership. But who do they get? Two old white men. And it's not just about their age. It's about their mental capacity. Mixing up names of younger, your, your counterparts is funny the first time. But by the third time, eyebrows are raised. And that's what's happening now. Having said that, there is a silver lining for both men. In the final race, they can debate each other instead of a younger, more energetic candidate. That would have made the difference more stark. Luckily for them, it's old versus old. Speaking of aging, here's a fun fact. Before the end of this century, the world population will shrink for the first time since the bubonic plague of the 1300s. Not because of an increase in deaths, but because of a slump in births. Across the world, fertility rate is collapsing. In the year 2000, it stood at 2.7 births per woman. Today, it is 2.3, and countries are worried, including France. France has asked 25-year-olds to get fertility checks. This has invited massive backlash. Meanwhile, Singapore wants people to celebrate the Year of the Dragon by having, quote unquote, little dragons of their own. That's what they're calling babies to make the concept more interesting, perhaps. But will these tactics work? Here's a report. France has a baby problem. Its birth rate has been in decline for a decade now. But in 2023, it was down by 7% from the previous year. France's current fertility rate is at 1.7 children per woman. That's much lower than 2.1, which is the ideal fertility rate to have healthy population replacement. And now France is panicking. But President Emmanuel Macron has a new plan, what he calls demographic rearmament. Following the extension of paternity leave, I really believe in establishing a new childcare leave which will replace the current parental leave. First of all, it will be better paid and it will allow both parents to be with their child for six months if they wish. But that's not all. Macron also wants fertility testing done for those aged 25. And the French are not taking this well. Critics say he has made people's bodies a part of the national plan. That this is an offensive intrusion especially as the number of people who start planning to have children at 25 is extremely low. The average age at which French women give birth is 31. France wants to impose tests instead of understanding why the birth rate is declining. So Macron is on the receiving end of a massive backlash. But France isn't the only one facing this plight. Singapore has a similar problem. In 2022, Singapore's fertility rate fell to a record low of 1.04. Last year, it rose to 1.17, which is progress, but still kept Singapore in the worst three fertility rates in the world after Taiwan and South Korea. Now, Singaporean Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong has urged families to have more children this year. He encouraged the people in his Lunar New Year address. This being the year of the dragon, Loong asked young couples to welcome little dragons into their families. Cute words of encouragement, but they may not be enough to solve the problem. After all, many countries are in the same boat. America, Italy, Spain, China, Japan. Across the world, countries are facing a big baby problem. They don't have enough. They've tried throwing money at the problem. Taiwan has spent more than $3 billion trying to get its citizens to have more children. Yet, it has the lowest fertility rate in the world. They've tried strange words of encouragement. Russia has asked women to have eight or more children. And it's not working either. <laughs> Many of the countries such as China, uh, Japan, uh, Singapore, Taiwan, they have been trying various things to have a higher growth rate in population. Uh, primarily, this has been through financial incentives for having children.
but we are also seeing that uh, they have not been as effective. Experts say throwing money at the problem won't cut it. Neither would hollow words. People need affordable childcare and housing, more jobs, innovative policies like affordable freezing of eggs. If it's not financially and emotionally feasible to have babies, the birth rate won't increase. And until then, hoping that the birth rate will improve is as fantastical a thought as hoping for dragon babies. Two years ago, a child was abandoned in Mumbai. That's India's financial capital. This three-year-old boy was found by the police. He was sent to an orphanage. Five months later, he was adopted by a family. This should have been a happy ending, but it wasn't. The adoptive parents were dissatisfied. They started complaining about the boy, claiming that he was badly behaved and they could not bond with him. So last year, they filed a petition in court. They wanted to return the child. This week, their wish came true. The Bombay High Court annulled the adoption and within a year, this child was abandoned twice. This story may be shocking, but it's not unique. It happens all the time. Thousands of children are successfully adopted each year and a number of these cases end in failure. Adoptive families cannot cope and they return the child. Between 2014 and 2019, more than 1,000 adopted children were returned in India. The highest number was seen in 2015 when about 9% of all adopted children were returned. But on average, 4% of Indian adoptions are dissolved every year. These numbers are jarring, but they're not limited to India. In America, up to 5% adopted children are returned each year. In the UK, up to 9% adoptions fail annually. Putting a child up for re-adoption is fairly common. But legally speaking, adopted children are no different from biological children, legally. And for this reason, returning an adopted child is just as legally complicated as giving up a biological child. Different countries have different mechanisms for this. In India, if a child has been adopted officially, the matter of return lies with the court. They get to decide if the child can be returned. It's a long winding process. It differs from case to case. But one thing is common, the family suffers and of course, the child's life is deeply disrupted. The experience leaves children with significant trauma and with lifelong doubts and concerns. But apart from the emotional consequences, what happens to those children whose adoptive parents no longer want them? In an ideal situation, children are sent back to the orphanage with a second chance at adoption, coupled with hopes for a better outcome. But our world is not an ideal place. Reports say many children are temporarily benched. They are removed from the adoption list until they can prove their preparedness again. Reports say only 0.04% of returned children are adopted again. But many adoptive parents are so desperate to return the child, they don't want to take the legal route. And that's where the problem gets much worse. In 2010, an American woman adopted a seven-year-old boy from a Russian orphanage. But soon she put the child alone on a plane back to Moscow with only a note claiming that he was mentally unstable. The case caused international outrage. Now put internet in this mix and this is the result. Unwanted adopted children are being traded online in an underground network and adoptive parents are putting up Facebook ads to rehome children on their own. So adoption dissolution is complex. But the big question is, why are so many adopted children sent back? They tend to face a range of problems, including behavioral issues, past trauma, educational problems, disabilities, which is why differently abled and older children are sent back the most. In India, children above eight years of age face the biggest risk of this. A lot of times the institutions can be at fault. Adopters have accused organizations of omitting details about children. Sometimes children are not counseled about what it would be like to live with a family. They don't know. Most parents are not prepared to address these problems, and some don't even want to. 
But despite this blame game, one thing is quite clear. This system of adoption is flawed. It suffers from a cavalier culture of disposability, where a child is either, either ends up with a blessing or loses another set of parents. There is no in-between. It's both unfortunate and dangerous. Our last story tonight is about Taylor Swift. If you haven't been living under a rock, you must have heard about her. She's an American pop star, a pop culture phenomenon. Taylor Swift is lifting economies and causing earthquakes. Colleges are teaching about her and Joe Biden wants an endorsement from her for 2024. It shows you how big she is. But with great fame comes great criticism, especially when you're a woman. Taylor Swift may be loved across the globe, but she's always under great scrutiny. And you can't dismiss it as a cost of celebrity. This is misogyny. Our next report tells you why the world loves to hate Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift, it's a name that resonates globally across generations, genres, and even continents. She just won Album of the Year at the Grammys. She's on a whirlwind world tour, and she's unstoppable. Taylor Swift started as a country singer and songwriter. She's now a global pop icon, capturing the minds and hearts of millions. Yet the admiration and accolades are not enough. Somewhere in between all this lies a paradox. It's the fact that the world loves to hate her. It started early in her career. With every album, Taylor Swift offered something different a new genre, a new theme, her journey as an individual. Yet for many, that's the sign of inauthenticity, of her showing different colours, of not being her true self. In 2016, it was like the whole world hated her. A feud with Kanye West made everyone believe that her career was over. Her reputation was down in the ditches. But Taylor made it back and how. She reinvented her image. She released new albums, she powered on, and then came the latest ERAS tour, her massive global tour spanning countries and continents. It's catapulted her into never-seen-before fame. It caused earthquakes, it's lifted economies. World leaders want her to tour their country, and the global economy is thankful to her. But even at the height of her fame, the jibes continue, and the biggest is about her love life. Taylor's songs talk about love, betrayal, friendship, and everything in between. But the focus is only on one fact, how she dates men and writes about them. Media has called her a serial dater. Tabloids speculate which breakup she will write a song about next. It's blatant villainization, something that's never associated with men, even when they write love or heartbreak songs, the likes of Ed Sheeran, John Mayer, and Bob Dylan. But the scrutiny doesn't just end there. Another cause of grief is her private jets. She's criticised for the number of flights she takes, the places she goes to, for not being a climate champion. Much of it is her fault, but the criticism is often limited to just her. Plus, her presence always seems to spark a debate, whether it's on the football field or at the ballot box. The Democrats want her endorsement. The Republicans call her a left-wing conspiracy. And football fans seem to want to burn her on the stake. All for what? For voicing her public opinions and showing up at NFL games to support her boyfriend. The whole problem might be that Taylor Swift is a successful woman in an industry often dominated by men. Did someone say double standards? Swift is now in her own legion. But the sexism still doesn't end. She has battled sexual assault, fought against rampant misogyny. From her love life to what she wears, everything is dissected, everything is scrutinised. In some circles, it's just cool to hate Taylor Swift. But whether you love her or hate her, there's no denying one thing. Taylor Swift has left her mark both on the music industry and pop culture. And whether haters like it or not, Taylor Swift is here to stay. And now it's time for Vantage Shots images that tell the story. In Italy, farmers reach the Colosseum with tractors protesting against the government. In Iceland, flowing lava threatens the country's top tourist attraction, the Blue Lagoon Geothermal Spa. And medal winners at the Paris Olympics will take home a piece of the Eiffel Tower. Finally, we're taking you back in history. On this day in 1969, the Boeing 747 
flew for the first time. The jumbo jet was the world's largest passenger aircraft at the time. It was called the Queen of the Skies. The 747 revolutionized flying, making it cheaper for the world. We're leaving you on that note. Thanks for watching. Have a great weekend. Tout aurait fait le militaire.